My name is Johannes von Moltke. I'm the current director of uh, CREES, and I'm uh, very happy to welcome everyone to today's CREES noon lecture. And in particular, I'm happy to welcome Ron Suni, the William H. Sewell Distinguished University Professor of History and Professor of Political Science here. Um, and I'll do a brief introduction and then uh, pass the screen mic over to Ron. But I, I will say that I've been in this business of introducing people at events for quite a while, um, but I don't think I've run across a CV like, like Ron's before to which it literally is impossible to do justice because it runs to over hundred pages at this point. And uh, that's not because he put in any things that kind of fluff it up, but because he's been extremely, extremely active throughout his career. So it's a great privilege, Ron, to have you here. Um, uh, Ron, as I said, is a professor here at the University of Michigan, uh, uh, and he is emeritus professor at, of political science and history at the University of Chicago. Here at Michigan, he was the first holder of the Alex Manoogian Chair in, in Modern Armenian History. And he also founded the Armenian Studies program. Um, he's the author of far too many books to list, although I'm going to uh, spool off a few titles for those of you who aren't um, directly familiar with uh, Professor Suni's work, because it gives you a sense of the breadth. Um, they include the Baku Commune, Class and Nationality in Russian Revolution, the making of the, uh, Ge of the uh, Georgian nation, Looking Toward Ararat, Armenia in Modern History, The Revenge of the Past, Nationalism, Revolution, and the Collapse of the Soviet Union, The Soviet Experiment, and many, many more. Um, many of these are single authored, but I think it's remarkable also, and should be remarked that um, throughout his career, Ron has been a, a consummate collaborator. There are a lot of titles that um, he put together with colleagues, particularly here in the his history department. Um, and it's also worth noting that much of this work has been translated into many different languages. Um, Ron has held all the um, uh, awards and fellowships there are to hold. So I won't go into those, but I will say that in perusing this long CV, I discovered completely serendipitously because I'm not gonna pretend that I read every line, but I discovered that on September 13th, 2006, Ron gave a brown bag talk at Crease, and brown bag I think is synonymous with Crease noon lecture, which is what we're doing today, called Making Stalin, the evolution of a Bolshevik. So welcome, Ron, and we look forward to hearing how Stalin has further evolved. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, I'm going to share with you guys now my screen and my uh, slide, which I think will help illustrate the lecture. It's a pleasure to be invited to Crease. I'm an old Creasian. That's one of my national identities. I go way back. I guess only Marisha is around to remember when I first came. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be back. And thank you, Liz. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Margosa, for uh, inviting me to do this. So I called this talk Writing About Young Stalin for 30 Years, uh, Why Bother? And the idea of the talk is that um, I think it's worth looking at the young Stalin. And I'm going to try to explain to you why I would decide to do that and end this uh, almost 900 page biography with the October Revolution, rather than go on into the Soviet period. I begin my big book, which I urge you to buy. If you don't want to read it, just keep lifting it and it'll build up your upper arms. I begin this book with two preliminary epigrams, followed by a well-known dialogue between Lev Trotsky and the old Bolshevik Vladimir Smirnov. So I start with one from Dmitry Volkogonov, a general who was one of the first Soviet historians to actually get into the archives and write during the Gorbachev period, a large biography of Stalin. And Volkogonov wrote the following. No one can be regarded as a born criminal. One cannot look at Stalin in the same light in 1918, 1924, and 1937. It's the same person, and yet it's not. In the 10 years after he succeeded Lenin, he changed markedly. 
Yet that's the difficulty of creating his political portrait. While apparently struggling for the ideals of socialism, however twistedly understood, he committed crime after crime, unquote. And then more briefly, I quote a, an old Russian proverb, do not expect more from the truth than it actually contains. Now the story. In the spring of 1924, Stalin's nemesis and rival, Trotsky, told the old Bolshevik Smirnov, I quote, Stalin will become dictator of the USSR. Stalin, Smirnov reacted, but he's a mediocrity, a colorless, colorless non-entity, a mediocrity, yes, Trotsky mused, non-entity, no. The dialectics of history have already hooked him and will raise him up. He's needed by all of them, by the tired radicals, by the bureaucrats, by the nep men, the upstarts, the sneaks, by all the worms that are crawling out of the upturned soil of the manured revolution." Unquote. Now, as you can guess, this is, book has, been come, has, had, has come over a very long period. And as a historian of the South Caucasus, what we used to call Transcaucasia, and the Russian Revolution. I've been working on topics like this for more than 40 years, and it's really been a painstaking thing, a, a joy in some ways, but I had to learn not only Russian, but Armenian. We didn't speak Armenian at home. My parents did, but not with us kids. And Georgian, a very, very difficult language. And at the moment, I'm working on Turkish. This was a time in the early 1980s when scholarly attention almost exclusively focused on central Russia, the Kremlin. Some of you remember that you looked at the Lenin Mausoleum and who stood where, it was Kremlinology, when few and very few dealt with other parts of the Soviet Union. Or maybe there were some nostalgic and narcissistic nationalists who paid attention to non-Russians. But so I wanted to sort of strategically draw in my fellow historians and social scientists, perhaps even a broader public, to look seriously at the region in which I had investigated and invested so much time to understand. And the way to do that appeared to me was to look closely at the early life of the major figure, the best known, the most important to emerge from Transcaucasia, namely Joseph Stalin. So that was my MacGuffin as as uh, Alfred Hitchcock might call it, or my gimmick. Beside the region and its culture, another interest of mine had always been when I first began teaching at Oberlin College and then the University of Michigan and still later at Chicago, had always been Marxism, especially the damaged and distorted history of the Soviet Union, particularly Russian social democracy, even more narrowly, Bolshevism, the most radical wing. And Stalin was precisely the vehicle to open up what I considered obscured histories. So I signed my first contract in 1987 with a wonderful editor at Oxford University Press, Nancy Lane, who was both supportive and patient. I produced a manuscript of several hundred pages in the 80s and early 90s. And then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, Something's going on here, Gorbachev, and then the fall of the Soviet Union and the steady opening of archives, first in Russia, and then eventually after a long time in Georgia, where the archives of the party had to be rescued by two young friends of mine because they were moldering in the basement, this, the abandoned basement of the old Institute of Marxism-Leninism. So I went off and did some other things that Johannes was talking about. I wrote, the Soviet experiment. Nancy wanted me to write a textbook of the Soviet Union. I didn't want to do that. Uh, but when the history came to an end, I thought, well, it has a beginning, middle, and end. Maybe I'll write it. And I'm happy I did. It's the best selling textbook on Soviet history. Many of my students will know it uh, in America. And it pays my local Ann Arbor taxes twice a year. I also ex uh, made an excursion into Armenian history. Again, uh, having taught Armenian history at Michigan for 13 years before I went to Chicago. 
Uh, and I wrote a book in, in 2015, the 100th anniversary of the genocide called They Can Live in the Desert, but Nowhere Else, A History of the Armenian Genocide. And then I went back to Stalin and with another wonderful editor, Brigitte von Rheinberg, uh, the book appeared from Princeton uh, at the end of last year. So was it worth it? Well, absolutely. Did I find things that were new and surprising repeatedly? And let me share with you now some of the things I think I found uh, in this endeavor. And maybe uh, the, that will encourage some of you to pick up the book, literally pick it up and build up your arms and maybe even read it. So I'm gonna concentrate in this talk if I get through it uh, on three themes. I'm gonna talk about first the biography from boy to man, the evolution of a Georgian uh, peasant boy, actually son of a, of a shoemaker, a cobbler, Soso Jugashvili, through his self-aggrandizement uh, as a hero who was called Koba, to finally after 1913, Stalin. Then I will try to get to, I won't get probably very far, but it's a big part of the book, the history, the origins of Bolshevism and Menshevism, which I tried to revise in this work. Now that we have different archives, the Cold War is over. One can uh, explore these things in a different way and then try to give you some idea of the overall arc of the book. So that's ambitious. Let's see what I can do. And I begin with a kind of warning because you know, the telling of Stalin's life has always been more than just a biography. There is of course wonder at the achievement of this son of a Georgian cobbler who ascended the heights of world power and by the his end of his life was one of the most powerful men in the world. He was of course the architect of an industrial revolution in a backward country. He was the destroyer of millions of people and lives. Uh, he was the leader of a state that stopped the bloody expansion of fascism that in fact, by liberating Auschwitz, the Red Army ended the Holocaust, credit they're not usually given for, to, and incidentally, saved the world for liberal democracy and capitalism, not one of his intentions. Stalin's story is the making of the Soviet Union. And so uh, people who look at Stalin, of course, are gonna tell a bigger story, their own way of evaluating that whole experience, the inheritance of his life. And such a story, it's very hard to separate from an evaluation of that young boy who becomes a revolutionary. The book covers more than half of his life, which was spent before the revolution. And it tried in its telling to tell a story that was not simply um, a, a, a story uh, that leads to the demon dictator, but rather a series of developments or cultures through which this figure moves from an early uh, romantic Georgian nationalist, someone who had apparently a beautiful singing voice, imagine Stalin, beautiful singing voice, was known as Bulbuli, the nightingale, a romantic poet whose early works were published in leading journals in Georgia, then sent by his mother, to a religious school because she wanted him to be educated. She was very ambitious for him. And later to the Tiflis Seminary in order for him to become a priest. Keke uh, Jugashvili was always upset by Stalin when he in the 30s said, Mama, uh, uh, you know, I'm a kind of czar in this country now. And she said, regrettably, oh, I always thought you would be a priest. So she was a little disappointed in her so-so. Um, but that, that's an extraordinary story. And I try to tell it as he moves through these various uh, um, cultures, these various uh, uh, imperatives of different levels of life, the seminary, the underground revolution, Georgia to Baku, to the international socialist movement, to Petersburg, to exile, uh, living as an outlaw for decades all of these things, and particularly going through the crucible of the 1905-1907 revolution, which was particularly hard, uh, very, very uh, 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 brutal 
in the periphery of the empire, that is in Georgia and the Caucasus. Now, one of the earliest uh, experience of this poor boy, he was born in that house, not in the columned museum that's around it, but in the little house, which was, has been rebuilt and uh, rebuilt uh, inside. Uh, the first, one of the earliest tellings of Stalin's early life has always been a kind of psychoanalytical taking. And that arose from a story told by a boyhood friend of his, uh, Irimashvili, who later became a Menshevik and an enemy of Stalin, uh, published in 1931, which argued that Stalin became brutalized by the treatment of his alcoholic father. This is the only extant picture we have of Besso, Besso uh, Jugashvili. Uh, undeserved, terrible beatings made the boy, writes Iramashvili, as hard and heartless as the father himself. Since all men who had authority over others, either through power or age, reminded him of his father, there soon arose a feeling of revenge against all men who stood above him. Even uh, from his youth, the realization of his thoughts of revenge became the goal toward which everything else was aimed. Well, Stalin himself didn't in his own writings uh, tell us uh, this story. In fact, when a German biographer who write, wrote popular biographies of great leaders, Emil Ludwig, asked him about this, what pushed you into opposition? Uh, perhaps the bad treatment by your parents? Stalin did not take up the uh, bait. He said, no, no, my parents were uneducated people, but they treated me not badly at all. This could have been deception. This could have been a uh, kind of denial of the way he lived. But when you actually do the research, you find out it wasn't Besso who beat him. It was his adored mother. It was Keke, uh, who, was, uh, who he loved very much precisely for her mujestvini character, her masculine, manly manner, her character. It was Soso's mother, not the father who abandoned the family, and her orthodox faith and insisting in her own ambition to send him to a seminary that was key to his upbringing, his love of learning, which continued through his life, his dogmatic style, his rigid and certain ideas about what he knew and what he could accomplish. She gave him a kind of confidence, even arrogance, which served him well in the revolutionary movement and in the uh, brutal infighting within the party that took place after the revolution. So this biography does not want to reduce the complexity of a biographical subject to a single explanatory key, in this case, parental abuse, which I think simply impoverishes explanation. And it leaves out what I'm most concerned with, which is context and culture, politics and ideas. There have been no biographies of the young Stalin of any seriousness, there have been some, but not very serious, which deal with his ideas, with the intricacies of the social democratic movement, with the imperatives of revolutionary life in the czarist autocratic police state, with the revolution. So rather than uh, reduce uh, his motives to suspicion, rationalization, compensation, or sublimation, I tried to develop an idea which I borrowed from another historian, Jude Stacy, who writes on China and Mao. I tried to uh, work out an idea of what, was, what I, she called and what I thought was very useful, a double realization, a double realization crisis. In other words, as he went through these um, various cultures and movements, as he moved from the ethnocultural setting of Georgia, the revolutionary intelligentsia, another imagined community, the Marxist movement, the underground, the prison, exile, all the way up to the upper circles of Russian social democracy, and then on to the fire of civil war, the inner workings of the Soviet system and the po political cultures of socialism. Each of them imprinted something on Stalin and changed him along the way. So he was being modified to what he had been. He was not born a criminal. He did not, as Simon as Sibak Montefiore argues, become a Georgian or Caucasian 
bandit. Rather than a gangster out to enrich himself, he was both the product and the participant in an evolving culture of the underground revolutionary. And this is a complex culture because it combines idealism, utopian ambitions, ideology, which acts as a frame through which you see and understand the world, as well as resentment and ambition, strong enough to impel him to risk the uh, Reck and uh, the, uh, the uh, fate of a political outlaw. Along the way, this young boy hardened himself, accepted the necessities of deception, ruthlessness, and violence, all these means justified by the end of political and social liberation. And there's the sense of that double realization crisis an ambitious, educated, rather intelligent boy from the rough streets of Gori, the town he grew up in, through the seminary, who has both social, you could say class resentments about the privileges he doesn't have and others have. So resentment, a powerful emotion about others getting things you think they don't deserve, but you deserve, as well as a second kind of inferiority being a Georgian, a provincial Georgian, son of a shoemaker, in a society as he moves on from Gori, here's the Gori Tsiche, the fortress of Gori, to the larger city, here is the young boy in the seminary of Tiflis, where he meets the Armenian bourgeoisie, the capitalist class of another ethnicity, and the Russian autocracy, the bureaucracy, the soldiers, the policemen who enforce the existing order. So ethnic and class or ethnic and social resentments and locations lead him away from Georgia uh, to in fact become a rebel, identifying with the Caucasian hero of Alexander Kazbeki's novel, The Patricide, uh, with Koba, with a revenger with someone who can write the unnatural order that capitalism and autocracy have brought to the Caucasus and to Russia. You have to do this by becoming non-Georgian in a way, identifying with an internationalist social democratic movement in which ethnicity is downplayed, in which you yourself develop an, a, 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 an identification with the struggle that unites all of the displaced and debased peoples of the empire. So in rapid succession, as the book tells, Soso left the largely Georgian town of his birth, Gori, and entered the big city, the seminary. And the seminary is very important. Here is that seminary, the Georgian spiritual seminary, the only major school that had any courses in the 1880s and 1890s in the Georgian language. It was run by reactionary Russian priests. So Stalin's educational experience was about the debasing and the marginalization of Georgian culture, which he at that point was still defending as a young, you could say nationalist and poet. We have lots of evidence in his own writings of that period. That seminary was particularly successful, not so much in producing priests, which it did, but in producing revolutionaries. Almost all the major Georgian figures uh, came out of this, who made up the Menshevik and Bolshevik movement, came out of this seminary. Not a very successful enterprise. It was in the seminary that uh, young Soso Jugashvili understood uh, that and lost his religion, moved away from his mother, uh, and understood that his fate and the future of his country was now uh, in the hands of young people, intellectuals, workers, whomever, who were going to be able to overthrow autocracy and move beyond capitalism. From an early age, the son of an alcoholic and abusive father and mother, mother was not alcoholic, of course, Soso knew physical violence. He bore it himself, he witnessed it, the beatings of his mother, in fact. Uh, in the street, 
and since, and since the gaudy streets, which were pretty rough, was his first schooling, his first university. And then already in Gordy, but in more in Tiflis, he became an intelligent. This beautiful word, you know, we, we translate it maybe political intellectual, oppositional intellectual. The intelligentsia, intelligentsia, a word we borrow from Russian into English uh, in that particular form, the intelligentsia was itself a kind of like-minded community of people who fell a debt to the people, to ordinary people, who were ready to sacrifice personal life for the cause. Uh, and Stalin identified as an intelligent and very quickly migrated through Marxism to its most radical wing, that is Bolshevism. Uh, and in Bolshevism, he found his mentor, that is Vladimir Lenin. And what was Lenin's position in this early uh, revolutionary movement? Here's a very uh, idealized portrait. I wanted to use this on the cover of the book, but my uh, editors found something a, a little grimmer uh, of Stalin to, to put on the book. I like this one very much. And here the young Stalin, a intellectual certainly, uh, is carrying Stodielet, Lenin's book of 1902, uh, and Burzola, the Georgian newspaper of the militant faction of, uh, of Georgian social democracy, those who ultimately would go over to Bolshevism. So why Lenin? Why that form of Marxism in particular? Now, if you know anything about that early, those early 20th century years about Marxism, there was uh, um, a, a, there were conflicts within the party about whether you could achieve a revolutionary consciousness among Russian and Georgian, Armenian, etc., workers simply by agitating and propagandizing the workers, teaching them the intricacies of capitalism, uh, and working in a trade unionist or uh, movement to better their position within the exploitative system that was then existing in the economy of the Tsarist empire. And Lenin rejected this view. Lenin did not believe in any kind of automatic or spontaneous generation of consciousness, but made a fearsome argument that in order to move workers from the dominance, the sort of bourgeois hegemony of existing ideas into a revolutionary consciousness, you needed social democrats. You needed people uh, who could, in fact, bring the theories and understandings of Marxism to the working class and give them a larger vision so that they would see that their plight and their power, their uh, indeed role in history, was to work as a representative of all social classes for the liberation of society. That's a very ambitious program. Uh, now, uh, most people interpret that, that as an elitist program where intellectuals will dominate the working class. It's not quite right and not what Le Lenin intended. He said social democrats are the ones who can study this and move between classes are the ones who can bring this broader theoretical uh, understanding to workers who spontaneously would gravitate towards socialism, but are held back by the hegemony of bourgeois culture and bourgeois ideas. Uh, uh, so what Lenin wanted was to generate, in fact, worker Bolsheviks, worker social democrats. And here was a young man who came from the lower classes, whose father, though he had been more an artisan, but occasionally an industrial worker, was a kind of worker intelligent, a rabochi intelligent. And so it was Lenin who particularly promoted people like Stalin, who appreciated this young man's practical uh, qualities, his toughness, even his ruthlessness. Remember, Marxism is both a kind of combination of idealism, uh, secular humanism, a dream of a better world beyond capitalism and liberal democracy, at the same time, a theory of war, of class war. Marxists understand that you will never, ever overthrow capitalism and the rule of the property classes who will not willingly give up their privileges and property and power. 
without violence, without revolution. And so it's a theory of class war. And this very much appealed, uh, this message, to this young uh, worker, Intelligent, who in the seminary, in seminary moved relatively rapidly by his third year, we're now in the late uh, 1890s, to a Marxist atheist revolutionary. And it's around that time that Stalin, young Stalin now uh, read a story by Alexander Kazbeki and argued that he wanted to emulate the hero of this novel, an avenger named Koba, a man of the mountains who has all of the values of purity and integrity that village and, and uh, uh, valley Georgians are losing under Russian, uh, Russian influence. And vengeance is a central theme in this story, the patricide that he read. But vengeance is not based on a personal disposition. Rather, in Caucasian society, vengeance is a socially sanctioned, even sacred instrument required to restore a lost moral balance. And the story is precisely about the difficulty, the impossibility to maintain the principles of honor and friendship and sacrifice with its associated obligations of the mountaineers with the degradation that was taking place under Russian autocratic rule. And Koba, the Avenger, cries out at the end, it is I, and he takes vengeance against the injustices of his society. And that name Koba would continue to be used by Stalin and his closest uh, comrades to the end of his life. There was a very sad episode where Bukharin, his close collaborator in the 20s, was in prison, about to be executed, and he writes several plaintive letters to Stalin in the 1930s before he was executed in 1938. And he, he addresses him, Daragoy Koba, dear Koba, but of course does not reach him. And those letters, by the way, were held by Stalin and kept in a drawer in his desk. So what attracted Jugashvili to Kazbeki and to Koba? This tale is very attractive to young people. It has passion and danger and rapid reversals and violence. And it's a well-told adventure story, but along with its romantic evocations of Georgia's natural beauty and the barely suppressed sexuality of several episodes, it gave Soso, now Koba, a vision of Russian oppression and Georgian resistance that perfectly matched his own experience, both in Gori and in the Tiflis Seminary. And so it justified the struggle against injustice and taking up weapons. Violence was inscribed in what had to be done. And Koba represented a noble man, an ideal, a person of honor, unwilling to submit to injustice. And so Stalin, or now still Koba, turns away from the comforts of society, embraces the freedom of the outlaw. And through this rebellion, Koba becomes, in one sense, authentically Georgian and a revolutionary. But he moves quickly. He leaves the seminary, gets his only real job, briefly as a meteorologist, and enters the revolutionary movement. Now, Georgia was a peculiar and particular place in the Russian empire. It was a place where Marxism, led by Noya Jordania, was the major ideological position of the national liberation movement. Not Georgian nationalism, but a Marxism that combined a kind of ethnic revolt and class revolt. So, the Mensheviks, that, that is Jordania, Ramishvili, uh, Chekheidza, and Tseretelli, all of whom would become extraordinarily important uh, other, uh, in the Menshevik movement, they would be a dominant strain. Menshevism is a kind of combination of uh, Russian Jewish socialists like Martov and Axelrod, and these Georgians who gave them their social base. Um, this movement in Georgia was aimed at the Armenian bourgeoisie, Right, but it was capitalism. 
and the Russian autocracy, but not ethnicized, but autocracy. And so it combined just these kinds of social and ethnic liberation uh, goals that Stalin himself was moving toward. But what Stalin does is move from Georgia because he adopts Lenin's view. He's a Bolshevik in a country in which Menshevism, the more moderate, the more democratic wing of social democracy dominates. And so he leaves Georgia and goes to Baku. Uh, well, first, before he goes to Baku, he initiates, but doesn't really carry out a, a uh, bank robbery, the so-called Tiflis X in 1907 on this central square, Yerevan Square in, in Tbilisi. Um, it's a, turns out to be a fiasco, but it's a, a major event. And he moves on uh, into becoming an agitator, underground man, a committee man, very much concerned with the intricacies of social democratic politics in Baku. And from Baku, he goes to St. Petersburg. In 1913, he writes his pamphlet under the direction and mentorship of Lenin, Marxism and the National Question, becomes the major theorist of nationalism and, and uh, the reformation of Russia after the revolution uh, to deal with the non-Russian peoples. And then from 13 to 17, he lives in exile in one of the harshest parts of, of central uh, Siberia, and then becomes uh, someone who comes into his own in the revolutionary year, always promoted by Lenin. There is in the book much of his personal life insofar as one can find it, he didn't leave a diary. He didn't leave intimate letters. He was not introspective. He was a creature of the social democratic movement, which denied personality, which, uh, which uh, reduced people in terms of their personal interventions, even though later he would become the center of a gargantuan, grotesque cult of personality uh, in the 1930s. This scene here is of his first wife, uh, who died in 1907 because of the harsh conditions that they lived with uh, in, uh, in Baku. And Stalin mentions uh, in Iramashvili's uh, memoir that his heart, his heart turned into stone after losing his wife. And this is who he becomes then, a romantic, sincere, revolutionary outlaw who lives in the underground and who lives through that experience that as I try to show in the book, eliminates uh, aspects of, of empathy, which he may have enjoyed or may have uh, known earlier. Over time, and I end with this, the humane sensibilities of the romantic poet gave way to hard strategic choices. Feelings for others, and I can show this, were displaced or suspended and even trumped no reference here to any particular person, and were trumped by personal and political interests. What originated as empathy for the plight of one's people, the Georgians, a social class, the proletariat, or humanity more broadly, was converted into a rational choice of instruments to reach a preferred end. Empathy was replaced by an instrumental cruelty, and once in power, those earlier emotions and ideals were subordinated to a desire to hold on to that power so arduously and painfully acquired. Power after the revolution became a key motivation to the imperatives of the new conditions in which the Bolsheviks and minority party found themselves forced to make unanticipated choices. The boy from Gori had become a great man. That is a powerful arbitrator of the fate of millions. But if you examine his biography, as I bet you will find if you examine many biographies of political people, you find a quite ordinary person who is placed in extraordinary circumstances. Now, he would understand that he was something like a czar, as he told his mother. But the passage through Gori, Tiflis, Baku, St. Petersburg, Siberia, fashioned a, a man who in a world he could not have anticipated was determined now to stamp his will on the Soviet people. 
Whether it was fate or luck, he had survived the trials of the revolutionary outlaw and emerged a tempered leader. He was damaged. He was destroyed in some ways. He was revived and had become something different. As Trotsky mentioned, history had hooked him and lifted him high. And now a revolutionary made by revolutions for the remainder of his life after October 1917, he became the maker and breaker of revolutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, thanks for sharing those images too. Uh, fascinating to see and um, fascinating to listen and learn. Um, I, uh, I want to remind the audience that you can ask questions uh, by using the Q&A function. You may also raise your hand and we'll, uh, we can promote you to a speaking role so that you can ask Ron directly. Um, but before we go there, I also thought I, the more, the longer this Zooming and the pandemic goes on, the more I miss audiences. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the audience, which be, has become anonymous in a new way. I miss going to events like this one and looking around and discovering friends or new people or finding out who's in the audience, which is harder right now. So I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people here and they come from, you know, there's your Cresians are here, um, um, uh, both colleagues and staff. Um, and of course, a lot of students, um, uh, um, in, including uh, Crease uh, uh, MA students who uh, had, when we asked them, I think at some point last semester, who are the people you'd like to hear from in the noon lectures, had specifically said, we'd love to hear from Ron Suni. So I wanna acknowledge that and, um, and bring that up. So I invite you all to uh, ask questions in the uh, Q&A or by raising your hand. Right now, people are shy, so I'm gonna get us started. Um, Shy seems weird if you're anonymous, but anyway. Um, so uh, um, I I was really taken by the epigraph from the beginning, and it, it it resonated through the whole talk. This idea that I think it's Trotsky you quote that somebody gets picked up by the dialectic of history, and 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 becomes uh, uh, somehow um, uh, uh, a different figure thereby. So my question is, I mean, this might be uh, too broad, but but I do, I did find myself wondering based on that quote about your decision to write biography, right, as a historian, um, to, to tackle history from the biographic side, um, uh, where, you know, many of these events could be told as a, as a social history, could be told as a national history, could be, I mean, as a cultural history. There were there are, there are obviously other ways of telling this, um, and while it seems obvious to me that Stalin is an interesting figure, I mean that's not what that's not my question. My, but my question is what what drives you as a historian to pick the biographical angle to meet this moment that Trotsky then identifies where kind of history and biography or you know the forces of history and the individual enter this dance. That's an excellent question, Johannes, and it was a problem because. If you think about my own inclination as a social historian, I would even say a socialist historian, though this is not Britain, this is America, and you have to be careful about those things. Uh, I would say was not to do biography, but was to do uh, talk about, and I would say my earlier work is like this, about larger forces, about uh, social and political conjunctures in history, about the environmental context, political, social, economic, in which things occurred. So biography was not that kind of choice. Uh, it was a tactical or strategic choice to get people interested in and to see also to answer the question of why does someone become a revolutionary? The making of the Bolshevik, like th that earlier talk. And, and also to be able to explore and expose the histories of which I'm very interested in, which is labor, socialism, Marxism, and the fate of this revolution, right? I'm not a person who rejects the Russian Revolution. I'm a person who thinks that it was a revolution that went off the rails, that something happened. Why did it happen? Is it about these characters? Was it Lenin? Was it Leninism? Was it what is to be done, uh, which has been used as a part of the argument? Or was it, in fact, the social context that mixed with the agency of certain individuals who made certain harsh choices? So 
my wonderful mentor, um, uh, Moshe Levine, when I asked him this question, what about, you know, Stalin and Lenin and so forth? He said, you know, he said, yeah, social forces, of course they're important. But if a person is the head of a party and takes power, or if he is the head of a state and is an autocrat, he or she is a social force. Catherine the Great was a social force. They had effects. They made choices that would affect other things. So you cannot leave out, uh, you know, Marx said it best, of course, men make their own history, but they don't make it under circumstances chosen by themselves. But they are makers of history. They create a reality that also shapes them. So it seems to me biography is appropriate. And the other thing is people read biographies. They don't read histories. They don't read the Baku commune. And they're forced to read the Soviet experiment. Um, so I tried to bring those two things together. Great, thanks. Um, Owen Johnson has a question. And if you unmute yourself, I think you should be able to speak. There you go, Owen. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Owen Johnson. I'm a retired faculty member at Indiana University. I was a grad student uh, at Michigan when I first met Ron Suni. I think he was a visiting professor from Oberlin, if I recall correctly. Uh, my question, how difficult in writing this book was it for you to separate myths about Stalin's youth from the reality? Excellent question, Owen, because there are so many myths. So even when you get into the archive and even when you can read Georgian and you sit there and tediously go through these memoirs, you realize that so many of them are hagiographic. So many of them are written with other purposes than telling the story. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make decisions all the time, right? I mean, look, we're living in an age of, of non-truths, of, of truthiness, of alternative facts. And so every scholar, every social scientist, uh, every uh, uh, historian has to, in fact, be able to make those points of judgment, see what's plausible, what doesn't fit? Can this be collaborated? What any good journalist would do as well. And so I won't say that I, I, I made uh, absolutely all the right choices. What I tried to do at the beginning of every chapter, I think almost every chapter, there are one or two epigrams. And these epigrams often contradict each other. And so their idea of doing that was to show that, there, that Stalin is a multifaceted figure who had different reactions on different kinds of people. But there seems to be certain things that continue, both by friend and foe, the hardening, the toughness, the smirking smile as he lurked in a corner and waited for the debate to go on till he would intervene. The idea of surrounding himself with close comrades who he dominated and who felt were absolutely loyal to him, right? Uh, that, that occurs already in Gordy. You see it again in Tiflis, and then you see it uh, in the 1920s after the revolution. So there are, there are those kind of things. The suspiciousness, the fear. You know, he was a person who came out of society in which honor uh, was very important. Trust was very important in terms of friendship because he, as a poor person moving up into Tiflis, uh, he had to rely on friends. There was no family background except his mother and his mother was impoverished. Uh, and, but the opposite of trust and honor is dishonor uh, and betrayal. And so those, those play a big role. And he writes about that often, right? We have some early letters that betray his own inner life. Not very much, but it's there. And he's accused of being an intriguer, of a, of a deceiver, of falsifying things. He's a politician in the worst sense of the word. That is, he's able to manipulate, to step back, to intervene when necessary, to change his mind. But fundamentally, there's a kind of dogmatism uh, that, that continues, a kind of rigidity as he accepts, as he moves from orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy, Georgian orthodoxy, to Marxism. And it's a very particular Marxism. It ain't my Marxism, that's for sure, but it's a very particular Marxism. Thanks. Uh um, picking up on the title that you yourself gave this, writing about young Stalin for 30 years, somebody asks, how has your own evaluation of Stalin's place in Soviet history changed in the years of writing this book? He's worse than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me, it's the whole profession. That is, there's no, 
excuse anymore for Stalin. That is, we know too much. The archives have all been revealed. He was unbelievably brutal, right? Uh, and unbelievably callous. And he, uh, that when uh, whatever stage it was that he lost that empathy, uh, it's certainly already evident uh, in uh, after the revolution of 1905, 1907, and maybe even earlier, right? Uh, so that 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 that's true there. Now, there are other ways. I mean, I always try to look at you know different sides of the issue. He's smarter than you think. Okay, Trotsky was right. He wasn't a theorist. Uh, uh, his writing is wooden, and it reads uh, kind of. Um, uh, uh, what would be the word dogmatically or kind of dry, he, but he's a very effective propagandist. Mm. He does what other politicians who will remain nameless do, repeating the same things over and over again, punching them in. He sort of understood how to communicate with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, ordinary people, and he was effective at that, even though he was in no way charismatic uh, uh, in his speaking or anything like Trotsky or Zinoviev or even Lenin to some extent. So those are, those are things I noticed. Um, uh, and there was one other finding, it's not so much about Stalin personally, but about Leninism and Bolshevism. As you read through carefully the volumes and volumes on, on Russian social democracy from say 1900 to 1917, you realize that the main aim of that movement, this will come as a surprise to many of you, was to create a democracy. The one word that appears over and over again is democracy, democratic. Because remember, they had the idea this is a backward peasant country. We will make a bourgeois democratic revolution. The bourgeoisie will come to power. They will expand the realm of the possible for workers to organize. They will expand the realm of the possible uh, development of capitalism and a proletariat. And then later, perhaps with help from the West, we can make a socialist revolution. So until early 1917 and Lenin's April Theses, this is a project about making a democracy. Lenin deviates from that in 1905 briefly, and again deviates fundamentally in 1917, when he has this really sort of grandiose gamble that we can make this revolution, we can create the spark to destroy the nexus of world capitalism in the context of an imperialist war, which is destroying millions of people. And we can, they, the West can help us towards socialism. And of course that didn't happen. The Bolsheviks ended up a small party on a sea of peasants and they had to retreat. And that's what the new economic policy is, a retreat that Lenin calculated was necessary for a long period of development, cooperation with the peasantry, not violence against the peasantry. He's very strong on that after 1921. And of course, Stalin stops that. Stalin changes that. Socialism in one country, forced collectivization, and the creation of, of an of a autocratic police state. Mm. The main thing, I'll say one more thing about that, just because students sometimes ask me after they read, they, they, they've read the Soviet experiment, and, and I say to them, so what do you think the dominant emotion of this book is? What's the, what's the thrust, the affective thrust of this book, The Soviet Experiment? And they look and they say, well, maybe it's nostalgia, I don't know. I say it's regret. It's regret that a revolution that was popular and bottom up and involved you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets ultimately resulted not in their emancipation, though in their significant development, let's not uh, be, overly negative to that whole terrible experience, uh, but it ended up not in uh, the liberation of the people, but in a new kind of autocracy. Mm. Yeah, I'm fascinated by your, I mean, you're, you're bringing in these affective categories, both in the biography and now in your own disposition. Um, there's a somewhat related question, uh, which is uh, whether you're aware of any attempts to analyze whether Stalin had some clinical psychological for example, sociopathic tendencies, would that explain anything about his choices, fears, and behavior? In other words, can one psychoanalyze that? I mean, you make the point about empathy, about resentment, um, uh, to what degree are psychoanalytic and clinical categories useful? Yeah, that 
was very popular during the Cold War. So it was important to you know, Western intelligence and policymakers to figure out who Stalin was, since he was so clearly the major um, decision maker in foreign policy particularly, and was so powerful. Um, but of course, no one got him on the couch and no one could really get into his mind, which was complex and which changed over time. By the end of his life, whatever paranoid tendencies he had uh, were exaggerated and had become extreme. And we see that from Khrushchev's memoirs and from other uh, things that we know. He may have had a series of strokes uh, in, the, in the late 1940s. So he's, again, somewhat different creature. But it's that uh, despot and a brutal uh, uh, tyrant of the 30s that is the most difficult to explain. Why the great purges? Now, Lenin and Bolshevism uh, used terror. They believed that violence and terror were necessary in the context of a revolution and for the working class or its agent, in this case, taking power. And Lenin defended the use of terror uh, in, in the Civil War years and then moved away from it. Because now in NEP and, and, and the slower development of that's going to take place in the absence of an international revolution, there had to be compromise, there had to be smichka, the link between the workers and the peasants, et cetera. And Stalin in the 30s makes a choice to institute violence by the state, by the town against the countryside, by the army and police, against ordinary people, against his own intelligentsia, against old Bolsheviks, and against kulaks and, and millions of other people in a time of peace. There's no internal civil war in Russia. There's a foreign danger, right, which they, they understand. Uh, and after he has won his political victories, Stalin has no significant opposition after 1933-34. And yet he turns on the party itself and destroys every single one of Lenin's major comrades who did not die before 1930. The last one being Trotsky in 1940 with an ice pick to the back of his head. Um, I, uh, um, Ma Max Spielbein picks up on the, on, uh, on, on the point that I think you made quite forcefully that the seminary, seminary more or less drummed religion out of young Stalin. He asks, um, uh, thank you for the really engaging discussion. I was wondering how Stalin's time at the seminary and his relationship with religion during his early years later impacted his political policy decisions on religion when he finally consolidated power and imposed his will throughout the 1930s, specifically his anti-religious campaigns. It's very interesting. Some of my students, I'm teaching a course, I'm teaching a Russian history course and Soviet history course, and also a course called Left Turn, the opposition to the world as it is. And students are very interested in why can you be also religious and also a Marxist, right? And of course, one of Marx's earliest writings, some of his earliest writings on the Jewish question and the critique of the philosophy of right by Hegel and so forth, uh, are against religion. Religion is a delusion. It's something that people need. He understands it's an opiate in, in capitalism that helps you bear the horrors of the world, but it's something ultimately that you have to liberate yourself from to find real consciousness and understand the world and liberate the human mind and so forth. So that that goes into Bolshevism, of course, and, and once Stalin leaves the seminary, which is very shaping in many ways, you know, as I tried to indicate, and I do more of this in the in the in the book. Uh, he carries, of course, that atheistic uh, view uh, onward. He is not particularly active, as far as I know, and this is a subject I would have to investigate more as I go into the second volume. But in terms of my own teaching and reading so far, in anti-religious campaigns. And what he's most famous for is during World War II, making a concordat with the Orthodox Church, that is employing the Orthodox Church in the fight against fascism. And so the old seminarian, in a sense, becomes, I wouldn't say a defender of the church, the church has to be emasculated, cannot proselytize and so forth, but uses the church as czars did as well earlier as an instrument of state power. And he saw that as valuable as he turned to a more 
conservative, nationalistic, Russo-centric point of view. Stalin's revolution from above in 19, early 1930s, I argue in my own work and elsewhere, is a counter-revolution. It moves further away from the 1917. It's more about state power and nation building uh, and control from above than it is anything like the empowerment of, of the working class or ordinary people. So is the, but are his, um, are his years, are they even years at the seminary or the months or however long he spends there? Is the, three years. So is that still part of his bona fides when he makes this concordat? I mean, is, you know, does it matter? Does he refer to it? Does, it? does it matter that he has this under his belt in order to negotiate with or force the church? There's one instance in which Emil Ludwig asks him in the 30s. He had several interviews with Stalin. Not many people had those interviews. Uh, what about the seminary? What, mm -hmm. what do you think? Uh, was, isn't there some good to this? And he said, he uses the word, and he means it in a certain way, they were too Jes Jesuitical. Uh, you know, Jes the Pope is a Jesuit, you know, and he's a good Pope and he's kind of a Marxist in my view. But be that be beside the point, uh, he, he didn't like the, the sneakiness and the, the control and the searches. It's very strange because since these are things that his own police would carry out, um, it, that, that was carried out in the seminary. One other thing to say about the seminary years is, there, there's the seminary which has a negative influence in terms of his education and psych, psyche. But there's another university that he's attending at the same time. And I use university metaphorically. And that is oppositional bookstore mm. and a, a intelligentsia culture that was alive and well, was illegal, and the seminarians were fighting against it. But these young students in the seminary had set up their own reading groups and they were reading whatever they could find, uh, sometimes pamphlets, sometimes marks, if they could get it, which they hand copied over and over again. Uh, and so what, what is that tradition? Against this ruthless, um, dogmatic Russian Orthodox culture as practiced in Georgia, doesn't always have to be that way, but it was, was this Russian humanism, this idea of Russian literature. They read this stuff. Uh, and how it influenced parts of the Georgian intelligentsia. And those things as well, uh, Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done, uh, you know, other, uh, other works like that, certain kinds of uh, Marxist pamphlets, were very much an alternative education to what he was getting in the seminar. Very interesting. Gregory Parker of the Eisenberg Institute uh, asks, uh, you mentioned that people actually read biographies. How did you approach this project given that it will reach a wider non-expert audience than a typical academic monograph? Yes, it, it is written so that it's clear. I mean, I in my teaching, I always advocate- Unlike everything else we do. Yes, I, I advocate clarity, right? Uh, this talk today was very broad because I was trying to summarize some of the bigger points of the book. Uh, the, the, the devil is in the detail. And, uh, and, but everything is explained. Any ordinary educated person uh, interested will not find anything obscure in the book. There are theoretical points that are to be made. There's things about affective dispositions and the role of emotions in one psychological makeup. But everything is 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 there, clarity and and to be explained. So, um, I hope it'll be an audience that will be broad. It'll be undergraduates, graduate students, scholars, and educated readers outside. That's what I aimed for. Great. Uh, Sam Brazil in the um, Chris M A asks, uh, you often describe Stalin as an ordinary person placed in extraordinary circumstances. What about after the loss of empathy that followed his wife's death? That seems an extreme reaction. Is that an ordinary response to his experiences or did he somehow become extraordinary, I guess, in that moment? Apparently, he, uh, if the record is right, if the things that, that are in the memoirs and even in his opponent, Iramashvili, are correct, uh, then he suffered greatly that loss and felt guilty about it mm -hmm. because he had taken this woman who gave birth to a son, uh, Jacob, uh, to Baku, and the conditions of heat and, and cholera and dirty air and so forth had a terrible effect on her quickly, and she died. 
and she, and he was uh, castigated by members of her family precisely for for doing that. So apparently he felt very bad about that. Later, his second wife, who he also was quite abusive to in many ways, at least verbally, if not physically, committed suicide. Uh, this is Nadezhda uh, Aliluyeva in the early 1930s, Svetlana's mother. And uh, again, it is said that at that point, uh, he wanted to resign. This seems far-fetched to me, but there are, are such accounts and was convinced by his comrades to continue. Sounds a little bit when Ivan the Terrible left Moscow for the monastery saying, I'm not coming back. And they all came out of Moscow to come back and he gleefully went back. That was for my friend Val. You should mention you know, He's here also. that we, <laughs> Val and I wrote a wonderful book together. This is part of what Kreese and what being at the University of Michigan means called Russia's Empires. So I was asked to write a textbook. I had just done a textbook, the Soviet experiment. I wasn't going to write another one, but I convinced Val. Sometimes she was reluctant at first. Uh, and together we wrote what is kind of a book size essay on all of Russian history from the primeval ooze to Putin uh, with the, uh, around the idea of empire. When was Russia an empire? It wasn't at first. When did it become? What does it mean? What are the limits and, and, and imperatives of empire? Is Russia today an empire? Or is it more like a nation state? And that animates that book, which I hope, hope people will read. Great. Um, Arakel Minassian asks, who's a Crease alumnus, asks uh, a question that I think you've answered, but I want to read it. So if you want to add something, please do. Be since beginning to write about Stalin 30 years ago, how much did the current book evolve from the original manuscript you wrote for Oxford? press. Is there anything you want to add on that question that you haven't said yet? Well, it, that book had did not have Soviet archives. That those, those were based on what we had available. And I was thinking of how I could give it a different take because of my interest in nationalism, nationality, and so forth. Um, so this this is, is archivally based, almost too archivally based in some ways, because it took so long to do and so forth. But and then the second thing is, getting back to the book that, that Val and I wrote and the whole evolution after 1991 of much of the study of na nations and nationalism is very much embedded in understanding of empire. That is, Stalin is a creature of empire. He creates another kind of empire. So the, that understanding, the framing of the story in terms of the periphery of an empire and of an empire-wide non-nationalist self-described internationalist movement, social democracy, and how that worked is something that was not there at all in the earlier book, yeah. earlier manuscript. Herb Eagle asks, while were other of Stalin's early comrades similar, similarly shaped and similarly motivated, hardened without empathy, so that they were inclined to become facilitators of his vision? I think so, but not all. My favorite Bolshevik, is one that many of you may not have heard about unless you read the Baku Commune, was an Armenian, no surprise, named Stepan Shaumyan. Now he would be called, had he survived after 1918, he was murdered and executed by anti-Bolsheviks in the deserts of Tur Turkestan, uh, would probably have been among those who were soft Bol Bolsheviks, who had other visions, Bukharin-like and others. And one of the things that we know from this history is that there were, at least until Stalin establishes firmly his dictatorship, there were many different Bolshevisms. There were those that Robert Daniels in a beautiful early book called The Conscience of the Revolution. There are many Lenins. Lenin himself shifted into a much more moderate figure in the last years of his, of his life. Um, but they're defeated. And so as Stalin emerges, the harder Bolsheviks uh, and those who are willing to follow him uh, become the ones who survive. If you want to survive under Stalinism, then you have to become almost a kind of criminal. You have to be willing to do criminal activities. And, and those who couldn't do that, they're eliminated by Stalin. If you wanted to survive under Trump, you had to be ready to cut those kind of corners and do things which were probably semi-illegal. Uh, and many of them suffered for that. That is, there were those who hitched their stars uh, their wagons to Stalin's star, who paid that price. And almost and many of them lost their lives, and the few who survived into the post-Stalin period immediately 
1953, overthrew the, as much as they could, they couldn't do it all, much of the Stalinist legacy. Um, there was a question from Paul Kubitschek, which might maybe we'll end on this one, but you, I imagine you could go on on this one. Hi, Ron, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit on Lenin's relationship with Stalin. Aside from his ruthlessness, perhaps, what did Lenin see in Stalin? Did you uncover anything in your work that sheds new light on their relationship? Uh, Lenin, as I said, was an admirer of this kind of Bolshevik proletarian intelligent. That is someone who combined both the class characteristics of a non-intellectual. Stalin and Lenin both shared a critique of intellectuals. Intellectuals were wishy-washy, uh, they were indecisive, they were, their heads were in the air, and so forth. And uh, they, there's a lot in Stalin and in Lenin where they criticize intellectuals. What they want are uh, worker intellectuals, if they can get them, and there weren't that many. And Stalin was one of them, so that was important. Uh, there was one pre-revolutionary moment where they had a big dispute, uh, not an overwhelming dispute. Interestingly enough, Stalin, after 1907, was very concerned about the unity of the party. And he was afraid that Lenin was too uh, militant in driving out dissident Bolsheviks, uh, very important ones, in fact, who disagreed with him about, of all things, ontology and epistemology, uh, questions of the material nature of the world. And, and, and Lenin, who was busily in the library trying to figure out uh, Marxist uh, um, uh, ontologies and epistemologies uh, was driving very important uh, people like Bogdanov, very, very in incredible figure, later the head of the prolet cult, uh, out of the party. And Stalin was opposed to that and wrote against it and thought this was a disease of the emigration of those who were, had lost touch with the, uh, the uh, imperatives of the movement uh, within Russia. But besides that, there was general admiration uh, of Stalin by Lenin until the very last years of his life. And Moshe Levine's wonderful book, which stands up so well, Lenin's Last Struggle, describes that conflict where uh, Stalin wanted a more centralized Soviet Union, uh, was coming down hard on his own Georgian national Bolsheviks, and Lenin was defending them against Stalin and or Jonikidze. Very worth reading still. Thank you, Ron. We'll end on this note from Shannon Pike, who says, thank you so much for your continued lectures. I'm a Crease graduate from 1989 and so much appreciate Prof Professor Stuni's lectures. Outstanding scholar. I'm going to second that. And thank you for sharing your vast knowledge and the, the, the incredible work that's gone into this book, which shows also in the way you 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 know it's like I, I feel like a huge archive has been processed and has you know you've you've given it to us on a silver platter and I, I I feel really grateful for it and um I'm sure so does the audience. So thank you for coming back to Crease. Um and we look forward to more. Thank you very much. Bye Ron thank, thank you. you thank you Liz thank you everybody. Bye everybody. Bye.